Okay, thanks. Sure. All in favor? Motion passes 9-0. Is there a fair TV on? Hope. All right, I am calling to order the regular, the Tuesday, June 23rd, regular meeting of the Fairfield Board of Education to order. Wow, I'm all right on time. I ask everyone to please mute your phones or your um, your computer audio. The public is joining us tonight by WebEx. I ask you all to please rise for the pledge. Um, I, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I apologize to the public. We were in executive session prior to this. Um, let me call the roll. I'm going to ask the members just to um, stay here, just because I, for WebEx, I have a lot of people in front of me. Mr. Rotelli? Here. Ms. Leeper? Mrs. Gerber? Here. Mr. Asa? <coughs> Well, he's here. I see he's here. Ms. Pico. Here. Mr. Maximilian. Here. Ms. Jacobson. Here. Mr. Peterson. Here. And I am the chair, Mr. Vitale, and I am here, but barely. Um, we are joined tonight by Superintendent Cummings as well as our executive directors. Thank you all for being here. Happy summer. Um, I hope everyone has enjoyed the last few days um, with school being out. Happy Father's Day, belated to all the dads out there. Uh, and let's get to business. I apologize for the late start. Public comment. The public is invited to give comment to um, the board, the, uh, the public comment form on the Board of Education website, as well as the email, public comment at fairfieldschools.org. Public comment will be verified and then including with the meeting minutes. And again, public comment is on agenda items only. We are joined tonight uh, for by our athletics directors, the two high schools, Mr. Fry and Mr. Parnes, who will be giving us an update on school athletics. Mr. Cummings, I don't know if you wanted to give an introduction or if we should bring it right to the ADs. Yeah, let me do it. Just thank you. Good evening, everyone. Just a really brief introduction. I appreciate that uh, Mr. Parnas and Mr. Fryer are able to join us tonight and speak to the, um, the guidelines that have been issued by CIAC. Uh, CIAC calls these guidelines the resocialization of interscholastic athletics and activities programs uh, and guidelines. And I would say to you that just like we've discussed with even issues related to the reopening of school, so much of what the CIAC intends to do is predicated on uh, the right health numbers, as the governor has frequently spoken, um, the health numbers are going in the right direction, and CIAC is able to implement the plan in its stages and phases as it's intended. So I've been asked them to speak about uh, where we are and where we're going to go, as well as if they would address some of the concerns that they have as we go forward, and we can possibly have some board discussion about those. So, gentlemen, thank you again for being here tonight. Thank you. Um, Mr. Parnas, Mr. Fry, I don't know which one of you wants to start or if you're going to tag team it. Yeah, I think we're going to, I'll start off, but we're going to tag team a little bit. Um, so basically there's four phases of the, of this plan to get back into full play eventually in the fall. And the first phase we're currently in and we've been in since June 1st, and that's basically just virtual um, coaching, which many of our coaches have been doing, giving the kids, um, an opportunity to do some conditioning activities, um, but that, and that's all virtually. None of the facilities are open for them at this point. The second phase is has an anticipated start date of July 6th, and that's when outdoor facilities would be open. Uh, that, and that's again, that's just a guideline for the CIAC. The we also each individual district also needs permission, obviously, and a plan in place for that to, to occur. Um, with that July 6th date, um, 
the recommendation is that coaches are allowed to work with student athletes and cohorts, cohorts between five and ten people. And those groups have to remain, you know, in the same cohort every time they, they work out together. And it's recommended that they only uh, go three days a week for a maximum of an hour per session. And each um, workout or, or time would have to be outdoors. They're not allowed to share any equipment. They have to keep masks on as much as possible. Uh, essentially, when they're waiting in line to do their activity or anytime they're not doing an aerobic or a high intensity. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. That's, that's Mia. Or anaerobic activity they have to stay on, but they can take it off for the after. Um And then uh, they also have to bring their own water bottles, and there has to be a a way of tracking how the kids, are, who's there, and they have to provide a self-inventory. And the CIC has provided a, a guideline to the questionnaire that they should fill out as far as, you know, COVID-19 questionnaire. Have they been exposed? Do they feel any symptoms, you know, along those lines? Uh, so that's phase two. Phase three, if everything went well, we'd start on third. And with that, the number of outdoor participants increases, then they would also uh, open indoor activities as well in small numbers. And basically all the other guidelines remain pretty much the same at that point. Um, the final stage, the anticipated date is August 31st. And at that point, pretty much everything is back to normal, hopefully. Um, if there's any, you know, specific questions about that, we'd be happy to to answer them. But that's pretty much the overall guidelines that they've that they've given us. Does anybody have any questions? Nelly, Sally, Mrs. Carter. Um, just one quick question regarding the the dates and coaches working with players. So, does that mean that CIAC is um, amending their rules regarding the legal start to a season, or you know, or is this I can't do small co uh, captain's practice, but only with coaches. I don't quite understand the nature of what the CIAC is allowing. <clears throat> They've amended some of the rules, but coaches have always been allowed to do conditioning with their kids in the off season. The only difference with this aspect of it is that they can incorporate some skill work into the conditioning. Okay. And how would that impact um, incoming freshmen? Uh, they would be allowed to participate as well. I, I know so much for my having only one question. Um, is there an outreach plan? I mean, how, how would nine be made aware of this opportunity? So if, if we are able to go forward with this and have um, a plan in place, we would post and try to get the word out as best as we can to incoming ninth graders um, through social media and our websites and you know, other various ways if, if we have the ability to do that. I mean, we, we already have some parents have been reaching out to us we've been responding to, but a lot of it has still been uh, kind of wait and see. We haven't had great answers. A lot of it's just been around uh, registering for fall sports. Um, and then you know, once, once they're registered, which we you know, encourage everyone to do, then uh, the coach of that program has their email and works with, uh, you know, booster clubs if that's how, you know, one of the ways they disseminate information, um, you know, to get word out about whatever activities are coming up. So uh, that part's, you know, pretty much remaining the same. Um, unfortunately, with not having school, you know, typically Tom and I go into the middle schools and, you know, talk to the eighth graders about fall sports um, because fall sports start before school does. And we we talk about, you know, registering and having um, those on file and so forth. So we've been, you know, we've tweeted out that, that type of information. Um, we have things posted on the athletic page at, at each school uh, that reflects all that information as well. So, um, you know, we're, we're, we're doing the best we can with the best that word. One of the other parts is that this is um, all voluntary. So kids don't have to participate. Coaches don't want to, don't have to do it if they don't want to. It's completely on the basis. Thank you. 
And since you mentioned uh, the CIC um, does not believe in captain's practice, neither do we. Uh, they, we cannot put um, 16, 17, 18-year-old student athletes um, in charge of a bunch of other student athletes with the same expectations that we have for the coaches in terms of awareness about, you know, concussions and heat, you know, exhaustion and things like that. So we always tell the students all the time that there are no captain's practices. And the more that that word can be spread, the better uh, off we'll all be. So happy to have that on Fair TV right now. Thank you. You're welcome. Mrs. Gerber? Uh, yeah, I had a question um, just because I'm a big fan of volleyball, and volleyball is the one indoor fall sport, and there's an awful lot of contact. <laughs> Has Have there been any guidelines as to how that's going to be working um, in the upcoming season? In, in the second phase, which, phase which starts to last, they would be allowed to do conditioning outdoors. Um, starting on the second phase of August 3rd, they could technically go indoors, but they wouldn't be allowed to use their regular nets and equipment anyway, because they're only allowed to do still work based on, you know, as part of a conditioning exercise. So it would be hard to argue, you know, you're practicing serving or buffing or setting over a net, um, you know, as part of conditioning. Um, so some, some sports, Based on these guidelines, it does seem that some sports may benefit a little bit more than others. And since volleyball is an indoor sport, that might be one of the cases. But they can certainly get together, according to this, on July 6th and do you know, everything as any other team would do for conditioning purposes outside. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any other board members have questions? Ms. Jacobson. Um, thank you for giving us the update. I appreciate it. Um, I just backtracking a little bit to the registration and yeah. coaches reaching out. So just so we're all clear, all coaches at this point have access to everyone who's registered so far. Yes? Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And so just for as ADs, um, I know you said it's voluntary for coaches or voluntary for players, which I totally understand. Um, but do you as ADs have any expectations, at least in some some sort of communication with them during this time, knowing they've been out for so many months, or just to make sure that they're well prepared for the fall, or is it just completely, if they want to, they can, or if they don't want to? Because I could see that being, well, maybe some does a lot, maybe some does none. I was just wondering if either of you have any type of standard expectation at this point. Well, did, I, did we lose them? <laughs> you hear them? I can't hear them. Um, so, uh, as far as you know, requiring them to do something, I'm going to do that. It's not under contract. But that's what happens every year. Uh, you know, being in the league that we're in and having the, the professional coaches that we do, um, or coaches that exhibit professionalism, I should um, you know, that it's pretty consistent that the coaches are involved. I know a lot of the coaches um, do things in the summer, kind of virtually, or they uh, you know, would assign things in terms of like training and things like that. So, uh, and that's the admin in person anyway. Um, so with, with some of the teams, there won't, really won't be too much to change. Um, I think the bigger change are the teams that use the for each school on a regular basis. They're not going to be allowed to be inside. They're going to need to be more creative in finding ways to do that kind of conditioning. Um, at least until August 3rd, uh, but with the season only a couple weeks after that, they certainly aren't going to wait until August 3rd to start, you know, listening and things like that. Okay, thank you. Yep. Ms. Vitaly, were you calling on me? Sorry, I muted myself because I'm talking. <laughs> I was calling on you. Um, I just want to follow up with a couple more. I wasn't sure if you guys had more to say or if this was then just questions for us, but um, one thing that was just said that I hope gets reiterated loud and clear for the athlete um, is the understanding that these workouts are, of course, optional, but also that they are no guarantee. You know, these are not the tryouts. There is no guarantee of getting placement on a team 
due to participation in these, I think that's something that's going to need to be very explicit um, because if it's not, it will get asked. Um, and I was wondering, I assume there's no change in the physicals in terms of the expectation of those being completed by a deadline? Uh, that is correct. Um, the physicals are good for 13 months. You know, a lot of the, you know, we've been having meetings every Friday with several of the athletic directors and members of the CIC since we've been in this situation. And there was a lot of comment about that because it's difficult for people to get appointments with everything that's going on. But as the latest guidelines say on here, they have not, you know, changed that requirement to this point. Um, so it may be more of a challenge, but it's still the expectation that no one can participate. Um, you know, once the, the season starts without uh, having a valid physical on file with the school nurse. Uh, in terms of the, it being, you know, voluntary and not having to do with whether they make the team or not, again, that's consistent um, with all years. Uh, we, will, we will work with the coaches to be even more uh, direct about getting that message out. Aware that there are a lot of families, you know, the student athletes and or their families, uh, their level of comfort uh, with this situation may vary quite a bit, uh, and there are you know people that may not feel comfortable yet participating in, even in the small groups, um, and we want to be sensitive to that. There are plenty of people that are chomping at the bit as well, and then they want to get out there and get together. Um, so we're going to do our best to you know, uh, you know follow the guidelines that the CIC and then whatever else that the town asks us um, to adhere to that. And so then just uh, two other follow questions. Do you have any sense yet of how many coaches are going to be willing to us how many sports are going to be represented by this in terms of in Fairfield? Any sense of that yet? Well, it seems that all of the fall coaches, the fall coaches are interested in doing something. I should say, I should say all of them. Most of the fall coaches are interested in doing something, whether it may be – you know, three days a week in the maximum with all kids or just sending out workouts or meeting once a week. You know, there's various levels, but they are interested in Great. Great. Um, and then just as the follow-up, right now you said August 31st is considered to be when it's going to be regular. Is that – yeah, obviously knowing the things can change, but that's the idea right now. Um, there's still some, I'm reading through the guidelines right now, there's still some, some guidelines in place at that point, um, but for the most part, it's back to how we, we were used to seeing this. You know, they're still suggesting, you know, we have hand sanitizer available for, for use um, and to social distance if possible, but at that point, there's, they've really taking a lot of the restrictions off. Thank you. Ms. Jacobson? A um, couple follow-ups. The Looking at the schedules that are posted for tryouts in the fall, some of they start before August 31st. So do those tryout schedules conflict with the August 31st, or do those tryout schedules fall in the phase three? Those tryout schedules would have to be done um, in accordance with phase three, which most of them can be done in that way. Okay. Okay. And then last but not least, I know this might be a different topic once we get more reopening stuff, um, but the transportation issue. Do you have any updates on transportation, if we're going to be limited to county or regional or any of that kind of information at this point? Um, the first phase is suggest that you stay within town or within local region. And then after that, they pretty much say to be announced at this point. So we'll, they're going to determine that as time goes on. But again, these are just guidelines by the CIC. These aren't actual you know, rules from them. And they, they made it clear that the distinction between the two. So it's really on the local district to decide what's best for us. Okay. One of the things that we've the whole computer. I have confidence in it. One of the things that we've discussed in our weekly meetings with our league is um, keeping the sub varsity schedule more local than the varsity schedule. 
in case we have restrictive busing guidelines, one of the things that we are exploring is possibly doing jamboree type things on Saturdays to limit the travel during the week uh, because we're concerned about availability of buses um, given, you know, we might have to, you know, spread things out a little bit more. So we're looking at those things, but we, ha you know, as a league, we haven't committed to those things yet. And again, as Todd just mentioned, because each town needs to approve things, it's, you know, we can't just make, a, okay, this is what our league is going to do. You know, each town has to say it's, o it's okay with them. So um, we're hopeful that as things continue to progress the way they have been in Connecticut, um, as the CIC has mentioned, we should be able to open up and, and continue um, with the, the dates that they have put out right now. So hopefully we will be more or less normal uh, in the fall. <clears throat> okay, and have you updated local authorities as it speaks, the first electmen or the health department on just what these phases are and they've been updated and whatnot as you're thinking about that? Or that, has that not happened yet? I can, I can speak to that. Okay, uh, sorry. No, the health department, uh, uh, Mr. Cleary has been given these guidelines, and I know Mr. Papa George and Mr. Cleary have had conversation about the different phases and what those entail and require from us. Okay, great. Thank you. Ms. Gerber? Yeah, sorry, I, I guess um, I, I had meant to ask this before and I forgot. Um, so I guess, and obviously it's, it's hard to have this conversation right now because we don't know what the school district guidelines are going to be and I know those are coming out soon but and, and obviously we've been having a lot of conversations simply based on the summer school guidelines which were incredibly restrictive and talking about you know with busing and 10 people maximum on a bus so and obviously there are more than 10 pe kids on a team so and, and obviously we're hoping that for this regular school year uh, these will not be as stringent as they were for the summer but what do we do about if there's a disconnect? You know, it, cause it, it, this sounds like if everything's going to be kind of back to normal, so to speak, August 31st for sports, but they're not for schools. How how does that work? I guess I'm just a little confused because this sounds like much more normal than what we've been talking about in our conversations about school. So I'm. And again, I, I realize that we still need to hear from the governor what the guidelines for the school districts will be, but if they are more restrictive, then what? Well, I, I, let me just jump in on that because I, I think, and, and uh, Seth and Todd, if you have something you want to add, but I would say that what I'm hearing about what state guidelines will look like, uh, similar to what I was already mentioned, these are, the state is going to, provide guidelines not rules with um, local districts having some authority over what they implement with based within those guidelines because of differences in variability within the state I'd say too that um, similar conversations I was rereading the um, CAAC guidelines today for example some of what I'm hearing from the state will be things similar in terms of language like cohorts keeping certain number, certain kids together um, in classrooms or on teams and there is, so that they're, we know who they're with at all times, in a sense, and trying to limit any issues. I think that the state is looking at um, trying to, I mean, I think the state's desire is to bring students back as much as possible into physical spaces. Um, and so I think there will be some matchup. I predict some matchup between what they're doing with the, with the sports and what they're going to do with in-class instruction. Um, but it again, as was mentioned earlier, everything depends on the numbers continuing to go in the right direction, um, and that is that. You know, things are optimistic right now, but will they remain so? That's that's really the concern. But I do think the state is trying to match up with CIAC, or CIAC, I should say, is trying to match up with where the state's going. Okay, thank you, Ms. Lieber. <clears throat> I, Ms. Patel, you tell me if this is okay. I was wondering if you could give um, an, um, an update to, is this sound all weird? Never. Is it better? Right. Um, what happened to juniors who were 
in the spring hoping to have a season where they were going to be recruited. Because if I was a fall athlete, I would be really nervous that the fall season is about to be interrupted. And what would that mean for your prospects of being recruited to you know, play in college? Could you hear any of that? Yes, we heard it. Okay. <laughs> um, it's a real challenge, and you know that's obviously not unique to Fairfield or Connecticut, for that matter. Uh, this this is something that the colleges are really struggling with, as well, trying to figure out how how they're going to view the athletes that they normally would have seen during the spring and then uh, potentially in the fall if there's if there is any kind of stoppage in play. And the summer activities being out, you know, a lot of colleges rely on those opportunities as well to see people at showcases and AAU and things like that. So uh, I don't, I don't have an answer to it yet, but it's certainly one of the challenges. Do we know if state guidelines impacted kids, cl like club teams, like you're saying, or? Those spring athletes, I've been so heartbroken for them because they miss their they likely miss all of their competitive play for their summer, likely team. Is the state guidance then equally strict on, on those activities? These guidelines are from the CIC are just for the school system. There are club teams and other leagues that are going to who has started practicing um, or after the game. So some of those people are um, You know, in many, in some towns, I would go to that field. I couldn't hear that well. Some, some towns have already opened up the field. Well. So there is options. And also, recruiting. Um, virtually, where colleges have set up opportunities for um, student deals and things along those lines. But it's definitely going to be a challenge for recruiting classes. For the next couple of years, it's really not, not just this one. Yeah, absolutely. And then uh, Mrs. Gerber had me thinking about volleyball in particular being somewhat vulnerable. If we have guidelines, and again, hopefully, they will look a little different, but the summer guidelines saying things like children cannot touch the same materials in a day. I mean, there goes volleyball, but there also goes football and, and lots of other sports. Um, this is, so forgive my ignorance around volleyball, but is there any way that volleyball can be set up outside in any of our facilities? And that could be the difference between kids competing and not? Well, I mean, if, if we're talking about touching the ball, that, that wouldn't change that. I mean, it's something we could explore. Exactly. I mean, my daughter plays volleyball. I hope she can play. Um, I, I, I wouldn't say, you know, definitely no. Um, we haven't, we haven't, that hasn't come up in discussion. Uh, you know, the, the volleyball being inside is, is something that, has come up in the past about being unfair in terms of access to practice opportunities and things like that in terms of training, because uh, it's always that way. The school's locked, but the fields are open. Um, but I, I don't know if, if moving it outside would make the difference. Uh, if it would, and we could, I mean, we'd certainly try to do it find somewhere. I only think, of course, touching the ball is still a whole separate issue, but a lot of the data and a lot of the guidelines seem to suggest that in an open-air outdoor environment, everybody's risk is significantly minimized of contracting um, this, this disease. So that was the only reason I, I raised that. But I understand there are so many more unknowns than known, so I won't take yeah. any time. Well, we, we can talk to Angelus about that um, and see if we can find some spaces that, that would work in the fall. Um, but Todd and I could work on that. And we'll bring that up at our league meeting and see if there's, there's other interest, uh, because that's a great point, you know, the outdoor uh, air difference. So it'll work. Thank you. Do any other board members have questions? Okay, seeing none, thank you, Mr. Parnas and Mr. Parker, for joining us tonight. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Take care.
Thanks. Okay, moving on to old business. I apologize, an, an item was left off of our agenda. It was the approval of the 2020-2021 budget adjustments. I'm going to ask the board for a motion to add an, ag an agenda item. Um, the motion will be that the Board of Education approve the superintendent's recommended adjustments to the 2000. Well, first let's vote on adding agenda item. Ms. Lieber, Ms. Jacobson, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. Okay. The agenda item that we are going to add is the Board of Education. The Board of Education and the Superintendent's recommend adjustments to the 2020-2021 rating budget. Put that on the table. Mrs. Gerber, seconded by Mrs. Maxson Canelli. Um, this document was sent to the board last at our last meeting. We discussed it there. If anybody has any questions for Mr. Cummings or Ms. Munsell. Okay, seeing none, we will take it to the board for a vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Can everybody? All opposed? Abstention? Motion passes 9 0. Thank you. Okay, moving on adoption of policies that the Board of Education adopt policies, policy 411. Point one and 4211.1 personnel certified, non certified, non discrimination affirmative action, equal employment opportunity, policy 4118.14, personnel certified, non certified employees, and section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, and Title II of the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990, and policy 4118.112 and 4218.1. Point 112 personnel certified, non certified Title IX sex discrimination and sexual harassment in the workplace. So, motion, Mrs. McNally, seconded by Mrs. Gerber. Any discussion or questions from Mrs. McNally? I received no questions from the board, so I don't know if there are any at this time. Any questions? Okay, um, seeing none, we will take it to the board for a vote. All in favor? All opposed? Abstentions? Seeing none, motion passes 9-0. Next is deletion of policy 4000.1. Recommended motion of the Board of Education to delete policy 4000. Title 9. Mrs. McAnally, seconded by Mrs. Pitko. Any questions for Mrs. McAnally or comments? And this is my reminder to the public, if anyone's listening in, that the deletion is because this has now been incorporated into one of the three policies we just passed. So we are not getting rid of Title IX protections. We are simply, this policy has been rendered redundant um, due to the policy we just adopted. Thank you for that clarification. This is Massa Canelli and reminder. Any questions from the board? Seeing none, we will take it to a vote. All in favor? Motion passes 9-0. Moving on to new business, first reading of a new course and tech proposal, AP Physics C, Mechanics and Electricity and Magnetism, magnetism excuse me, Magnetism, excuse me. Um, Mr. Cummings, would you like to give us yes. an introduction to this? Really quick, uh, thank you, uh, Mike Cummings, Superintendent Schools. I, we've got uh, with us tonight, Ms. LaSalle, who's our program director for 612 Science and the STEAM program, and she can speak to the course proposal as well as the text. This is an AP course that would be added to our menu of AP courses uh, and, and go with existing AP physics courses. Um, she can also speak to the text, and if the board is, is interested in moving forward with this, we do have uh, a link that can be sent, well, excuse me, would be sent out tomorrow to the community so that parents can look at the text online and provide commentary through a Google form back to us uh, uh, for feedback. So, Ms. LaSalle, thank you for being here tonight. Hi, 
Hi, good evening. Can everybody hear me? Can. Hi. So um, the high school science department would like to propose a new course beginning for next year, um, AP Physics C. Um, I believe you've been given the course proposal. Um, so I'm here to answer any questions that you might have about the course. Does anybody have any questions? Mrs. Gerber. Um, yeah, I, I had a question um, just uh, based on personal experience as a parent of uh, students uh, who took physics. Um, there was an issue in terms of uh, staffing and having enough staffing for some of the physics classes. So I'm just wondering how that is, how has that been factored into this decision? Um, by offering AP Physics C, um, we are planning on using our existing staff to teach those, that course in addition to the other courses. Uh, my prediction is what will happen is we'll have less, uh, maybe less sections of AP Physics 2 running as students would choose to take AP Physics C as an alternative. So that this, this, this provides students an opportunity to choose a calculus-based versus a non-calculus-based physics course. So it wouldn't require additional staffing. Okay, and in terms of, I mean, do you have a sense of how the numbers might play out? With the, with the new course? Um. Yeah, this, the, we're going to have um, one section run, you know, just one class, and that would be anticipated. It would start small, um, as new courses often do. Um, but then as word of mouth spreads, it will probably grow over time. Um, and and what, what we've seen is what we predicted, too. Kids, kids either chose to elect to sign up for Physics C or Physics 2. They don't take both. So uh, in the past, kids, you know, you might have had two classes of AP Physics C at one of the high schools, but now you'll have one of AP, I'm sorry, AP Physics 2. Now you'll have one section of AP Physics 2 and one section of AP Physics C. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, and so and when you say for next year, do you mean the next academic year? Like, so you're talking 21, 22? One, no, 2021. So this fall? Yes. So have students already signed up for this course? We, we put it in the program of studies with uh, pending BOE approval. So to see, it, it also helps us gauge interest in the course as well. Okay, but I, I guess this would be maybe to the chair. We're not voting on this tonight, though. No, we're not. We're going to have a meeting in July to vote on this. this okay, it. and so I guess the question then would be, is would July be enough time, well, I guess how many students expressed interest um, in this? I don't have the numbers exactly in front of me, but we could get them for you. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Maxinelli. Yeah, before I vote on any course, normally if we're seeing a new course, there's a whole curriculum document that should be accompanying it. So um, I'm wondering, I mean, we're getting this late, we have no curriculum document, um, and I'm not clear, and I also would be interested, we should already have these numbers to know that this is a viable course that we're supporting, so th there seems to be a lot of information missing. I don't know what you can speak to offhand. Um, so I, I'm, I have to say I'm, I'm, I'm relatively new here as well, so this is a new process for me, and I apologize if um, there is um, a concern. Um, the curriculum would be following the AP Physics C curriculum. Um, you know, you, you follow the, the curriculum document provided by College Board, um, and the teachers um, create a syllabus that follows that, and that would have to be approved by College Board. That hasn't been done yet. Um, but that's, that's something that we could put together. Um, we, uh, we looked at, we reviewed different textbooks as far as what text we'd like to use for the course if we were able to run it, and um, um, I, think, I don't know if I, that answered your question. Um, it, it, it does. I will say, just putting the board on notice, um, I'm not willing to support any course that does not come with a curriculum document. Um, 
I, this is something that is consistent with all of our courses. Um, we've seen nothing about why this one should be offered. I, I did appreciate the descriptor, so thank you for including that in our packet. Um, but this is a document that anyone should be able to access on our website, and without that, I would not be willing to support any course. Um, because if nothing else, I also might ask is that why are we necessarily choosing another AP course to add? You know, there's a, a lot of freedom we could have with developing an advanced upper elective. I, I think of something like calculus, which has the multivariable calculus option, which therefore doesn't have the stricture or the restrictions of, of an AP curriculum. And so like that, that's a case I would like to, to hear made of. For these obviously gifted students pursuing a definite interest in engineering, I love to think that I love to think that we have something um, that would be enabling them to pursue that line. Um, it would be invaluable for the community, you know, the state at large, but I'd like to know why this is better than developing our own advanced elective. And as I said, without a curriculum document, I would not be willing to support this. We can, let me jump, let me jump in. We can get you the AP uh, curriculum document. And I, I want to follow up with what Ms. Lozano said and apologize for the delay in this. As you can see, the, the staff has been at work on this, but there was a disconnect between the development and central office in terms of bringing it forward to the board, which falls on, which falls on central office. The, um, we, and we can, again, we can get the document to you. I don't, I don't want to pit, and I know this is not your intent, uh, Ms. Kelly, but the, um, uh, and Dr. Rasmussen is not with us tonight, but there is, conversation as we move forward in the math curriculum work around extending our upper electives. Um, as we've seen, and as you're aware, we've seen an increase in the number of students who are coming into high school, having completed algebra one, having moved to the, the math sequence. We are seeing um, more students who, who take that upper elective math. And so that's something that they're gonna be bringing forward as possibilities in their curriculum review work. So that's. One does not preclude right, the other, I guess I'd say. Okay, and I think down. that the work here was to, to bolster the um, physics offerings to students because it was, and I hate to put it this way around a curriculum, but um, a relatively um, quick way to move forward in extending the science curriculum to those students who want to pursue those types of careers. An AP course comes essentially almost ready-made, whereas a multivariable class would take some time to build. And again, since we were already doing the math work, we wanted to be part of that overall um, effort. Okay. Mr. Peterson? First of all, this course is not listed as pending BOE approval in either the Ward or Ludlow uh, Program of Studies for 2021. Other courses are listed as pending approval, but this one is not. Um, you might want to go and check that. I, I have it right up on the other screen. I don't know why that was not listed. Um, it seems odd. Um, I have a lot of the same concerns that Mrs. Kennelly raised. Um, I, I, I don't have an objection to it. It looks like it, it will align with a an existing AP course. Um, uh, you know, if there is demand for it, I understand. And let me just confirm one of the things you said, so you are going to be teaching this with existing staff. So there's not going to be a budgetary impact in terms of increased teacher headcount for this, right? But will there be any uh, costs that we're going to incur from program development for this curriculum, or is this going to be based off of kind of existing curricular outlines? Um, costs in terms of materials, um, I would say that we we could use the current training. materials we have. I'm sorry. No, please go ahead. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, we could use um, our current physics materials for this course. They would be appropriate. Um, it would be um, the cost associated would be uh, sending teachers that would teach the course to training. Um, which I had already requested in the budget uh, as a placeholder for next year, and also sometimes to, some time to put the curriculum document together off of the AP, uh, AP the College Board's curriculum document. 
which also I had put in, into the budget for next year as a placeholder. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Um, hi, thank you. Um, just a couple questions. So, um, from my understanding, and correct, correct me if I'm wrong, this course was already offered out, and there are students at both Ludlow and Ward Air High Schools that have now registered for this course and have probably been notified by their teacher regarding summer work for this course. Is that correct? If there's summer work. I don't know if there is, but normally APs there are. So is this already kind of in flux, like moving already? Um, or is that not the case in this instance? So I'm, I'm going to speak to the fact that it wasn't listed in the BO, in the program of studies. I don't know. Um, I requested for the program of studies that it said pending BOE approval. I'm not sure what happened there, and I will follow up on that. Um, then um, students requested the course. And um, yeah, we did scheduling with uh, planning if the course was approved, that it would run. But it was always pending approval from the board. Okay, so just to reiterate my question, I'm just curious, and maybe this is something that might you have to get back to us on, you know, have students been notified of their teacher, they're doing summer work already, or is that not a part of this course? And if you don't know the answer to that right now, that's fine, but if we're talking about a disruption here, that would be good to know. We're going to have to check that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Pickle? Um, I'm sorry. I just need a clarification. Has the curriculum already been written for this course, or is it going to be written as the class proceeds? Like, are you planning this unit by unit? No, we would develop the we waited on the curriculum development pending approval, and and really the curriculum is outlined by the college board. So it's just a process of taking the college board the curriculum and and making it our own. So we would do that before the course starts. And are you writing the curriculum, or are other physics teachers writing the curriculum? It would not be me. It would be the teachers, and again, they would be going off of the. College Board's AP Physics C curriculum document. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Mrs. Gerber. Uh, yeah, just really quickly, I did check and there is summer work for AP Physics C listed um, on the whole list of all of the AP summer work. There is something there for that. Thank you for looking at that. I was wondering that. Any other questions by board members? <laughs> Do you know um, how many other districts in Connecticut are offering this course? No, I don't, but I can find that information out for you. And uh, this is a little bit off topic. Since they start the school and we don't necessarily know that students are going to be back in classrooms um, every day, five days a week for the entire school year. Do you have any concerns about starting a new class with distance learning possibly being a factor? Um, of course, uh, the possibility of distance learning is concerning across the board. Um, I think, um, the, the, again, the, uh, I would guess that the student that would sign up for this course would be uh, an upper level, most likely a senior, um, and I think it might be, even in a distance learning format, be a good preparation for college. I'm more concerned, honestly, with just um, the teacher, but this is a new course. The teacher's going to be teaching in a new format um, as well as the student. Do you, how, how do you feel the feedback was from other science classes, AP science classes, in the distance learning format? Um, I would say from speaking to the AP science teachers that they felt their AP courses went very well. Um, uh, and they didn't have, you know, I think the concerns about running courses is very different at different levels. 
Um, you know, it's very different at the high school level than it is with younger students. And I think it's different with upperclassmen and it's different with students that might be signing up for AP classes in general. So um, they, um, they uh, had mostly positive experiences from what I've talked to them. Okay, thank you. Um, Ms. Pickle, I see your hand up. Thank you. Um, I don't have the program of studies in front of me. If you could just tell me, you said that this, the difference between this physics class and the other one is that the calculus is not factored into this. So what is the prerequisite for math for them to take this course? The prerequisite, they, I'm going to look, pull up the proposal while I'm talking to you. The prerequisite for math is uh, successful completion or concurrently enrolled in AP Calc AB or AP Calc BC. But this course doesn't require calculus. This is, this, it, yes, it does require calculus. That's what it is. It's a calculus-based physics course. Gotcha. We have an offer, and, and uh, one thing I will add, uh, the driver for proposing the course has been student requests. So there's been a lot of students who have asked for this course, the students who are interested in going to engineering programs, they feel that it would give them a leg up in the application process if they've taken a, a calculus-based course. Anything else, Ms. Pickoff? Uh, Ms. Jacobson? Um, so I one final question, does, and I apologize, I don't have the program of studies in front of me either. Um, does this course have a lab component to it that's outside of the regular block time, like a mini lab to it? Yes, all the AP science courses. Okay. So this would, if we didn't approve this for this fall, there would be student scheduling issues that would have to be addressed. There would, there, there would have to be um, a changes, and again, it's not a large number right now because it's a new course and there's not a large number, but generally what students have done, I, I'm assuming here, but I think it's probably correct, is that they've signed up for AP Physics C instead of AP Physics 2. So if, if AP Physics C wasn't offered, um, though they would probably be disappointed, they, they could take AP Physics 2. Okay, thank you. Mr. Peterson. Hi, thank you. I, I have to confess I'm feeling a little blindsided. Um, I, I, I was coming in tonight with good feelings about this. I'm, I'm extremely pro-physics. My main question was going to be why aren't you calling it electromagnetism instead of breaking up the universal force into two distinct things when they are not. But um, I'm looking at the budget book. The budget book does have uh, – $23,924 for 2021 for grades 6 through 12 curriculum development. The only thing that I can see in that, in that list that is going to apply to this is AP training. A whole bunch of other stuff is listed, but it doesn't list that there's going to be a new course anywhere in this, in this summary. Is that, Mike, is that where I would have found that we're going to put in a new course? I'm sorry, you mute, you mute me. Yeah. Depending on the account number uh, that you're looking at, I don't know offhand what account number you're looking at. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at the materials in the back, page 158, the, the, the detail. It, it, it lists implementation guide and assessment style. Oh, okay. 7 and 10, AP training, assured experiences, various trainings, professional learning conferences and workshops, professional yes. memberships. I mean, that's, that's where I see this broken out, and it doesn't say we're launching a new course. No, and that's not an exhaustive, just as you read it, it's not an exhaustive list to the level of detail. It, um, I would, we have a couple of teachers that are going to be involved with this, and, and because it's an AP physics course being based off an existing curriculum, it's not a tremendous amount of hours, but that's where you would have seen it. I just don't think it was broken out as in specifics like that. All right, I may ask for the future, for if, if things like this are being contemplated in budget season, that we be presented with information that this is going to be part of a new course development. I don't feel like this was. No, and it should. It, we have we have a lot to look over and details get missed, and I I don't want to I don't want to undermine the work that's been done on this, and I see the value of it. I'm just I'm feeling like it's coming extremely late in the day for people who are already signed up for this course, and we haven't approved it yet. So 
that's that's kind of where I am with that. Agreed. Mr. I'm not going to repeat everything that's been said here, but really piggybacking on Mr. Peterson here, um, <clears throat> I appreciate the work that went into this, but um, as Mrs. Maxson Canelli said, this is absolutely not the way this is to be presented, um, no matter whose fault this is. Um, so I think we need to restart here. And also, I, I look at this as there are budget implications. So from what I've heard and, and what's in the book and, and what we just discussed, this to me seems like new curriculum, new initiative, or whatever you want to call it. Okay, when we went through the budget season, this budget season was very tight, and we got cut quite a bit, and we were able to carry forward um, a good safety net in a non-lapsing account for things. But I think we need to be very careful and go back and make sure that this was all accounted for if we're going to do that this year. Because if it wasn't, then we need to hit pause. Because we sat in front of the other town bodies and said that we were not introducing anything new and if this falls in there, I'm not saying it does, but if it does, we need to really look hard at that and take a lesson learned. Ms. Reza, it, it is in the budget that we protected the, um, for a large part in the budget process, we protected the instructional and curriculum accounts. As, as, you, as you know, as the board knows, there's not a lot of funding in that. So we were very protective of the amount of money in there, although we did not increase overall from the previous year to this year um, the amounts, we just redistributed the funds, but we did put this in as a new textbook purchase in the budget, and uh, again, we've protected that all along. It, but going back to what Mrs. Max and Canelli said, we're, we're in June, and we're to approve this in July for kids already signed up for something that we have not had a proper vetting or anything. So um, not to discount the science department or anybody involved with this, but this um, this needs more discussion. Yeah, and, I, and what I would say is I agree with you. I think that the, our intent is never to put the board into a position where we're coming forward with you, and we did this. We, we don't want to bring anything forward to you that's in every other aspect a done deal um, and put the board into a spot where they, they're kind of back to the wall. So that was not, that's, that's what happened, and that was, that was our mistake. Mr. Cummings, thank you for recognizing that. Um, I do share some of the, the frustration of my fellow board members. I would ask just for those students that are currently enrolled for this course, if they could be contacted and just maybe tell them to wait a few weeks before starting their summer work until the board takes action on this, to say the very least. Um, but I know that there were some other questions. Mrs. Maxwell, did you have your hand up? Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm cataloging my questions so I don't hit them all of you now. I just, I have to say it in public, I don't understand why we're getting this June 23rd. And, and never mind all of the missing pieces. That budget book was put together, especially in November and December, and I don't understand that. And I think a case needs to be made for an, adding another AP course. As we know, AP physics is not one where we've had demonstrated success, and now we're tackling a more rigorous curriculum and I, I just I don't I, I'm cataloging my questions I'm not going to do them all now I'll shoot off an email but I don't understand why we're getting this June 23rd I think the only, the only thing I can say to you is it was just missed it was just missed in the course of the second half of the year there's no other explanation for it there was a disconnect between the time to put the budget together and when it was time to, to um, Essentially, as we're rolling out the end towards the end of the year, um, it was brought forward that we hadn't done this, and, and so there's no other explanation but other than it was missed. Okay, thank you. Thanks for that, Mr. Cummings, and I. I do. Um, I'm not to make excuses, but I do appreciate this is a challenging time, and I know that it is, it is difficult um, not being physically in the same building with people. Um, that things do often get missed. But uh, I invite board members to please follow up with your questions to the superintendent and Mrs. Wallace. Any final questions on this? 
Okay, thank you. Seeing, thank you, Mrs. Hulk, Ms. Hulk, for presenting tonight. Moving on, food services financial summary, and Mrs. Munsell, would you like to walk us through the document? Sure, Doreen Munsell, Executive Director of um, Finance and Business Services. Um, I think somewhere on this screen, too, we also have uh, Rick Emery and um, Maura O'Malley from Whitson's, but I'll give you an overview. Um, I'll go over the meals first. Uh, we did, we compared meals this year to February of last year because that was the last uh, full month of service that we had. And as you can see, um, we were doing well. The program was doing well. Uh, we were on a good path. Um, and I should also say that this, um, these percentages don't even reflect the average meal served per day. On, uh, it hasn't been adjusted for the days that serve it, uh, meals were not served for um, half days or whatever. So it's actually even better than this. Um, so the, the, the program was on a good path um, and then COVID hit and um, things changed as we all know. Um, during the COVID period, the three month period, um, the food service staff uh, served like something like 53,000 meals um, over that three month period. Um, and I, I'd like to take an opportunity to, to recognize those people. I'm just gonna uh, mention their first name, Linda, Margaret, Tisha, Mary Alice, Malene, uh, Tim, uh, Maura. Uh, these are the food service staff uh, in, either in the kitchen or behind the scenes. And also, I'd like to thank the custodians that helped us uh, to distribute meals when we changed course and, and we're handing out meals. Um, so this whole COVID situation has, you see in the financials, taken a financial, uh, has had a financial um, impact on the, on the program. And we'll, you know, we're projected to have a loss. Uh, despite that, um, we are recommending no uh, increase in meal prices for next year uh, because of the economy and the impact it's had on our families. Um, we didn't think it was it was the time to do it. Um, so that's that's uh, in a nutshell everything about food service that's happened over the, the past year. I don't know if Maura and um, Rick, if you want to mention anything from the Whitson's perspective. Hello. Listen, we can hear you. Oh, okay. Yeah, that was, no, we've we've done everything the district's asked. It's been a tough time. You know, we haven't served a, a, a daily basis. We're not serving a lot of people, but they're people in need. So it was something we were proud to do, and the team has stepped up and done everything we've asked them to do. Thank you for your service during this time. Um, well, it's really more in the team. I just support them, just like Doreen supports me. Doreen supports all of us at times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, do any board members have any questions? Or Doreen, do you have anything else to add before I take it to the board? No, I think that's it. Ms. Jacobson, you have your hand up. Um, Jen Jacobson, um, to Mrs. Mudsell, um, did we not have a guaranteed minimum for fiscal year 20, or did we have one, and just because of the situation, that's not happening, or, because I know we normally have a guaranteed minimum profit. We did, but we, or we do, but we had, um, we had, we had just got, We had discussion with Whitson's that um, when on the out, uh, outset of the COVID that um, that would not be able to be sustained because it was a losing situation what we were doing. So we knew that up front. Was it the same as this year, last year? Was it the 95? No, it's 130. And we were, we were on track for that. Yeah, in February we were at 119,000. Okay, and is the same provision in place for next year, fiscal year 21? Yes. Yes. 
So I, I understand the, the prices, uh, of course, at this time. But are we looking at potentially, I mean, obviously we don't know what things are going to look like next year at this point, but yet we're kind of proving this right now. Um, we could be looking at another substantial loss. Uh, we could. There's also there's little known as to sorry. Go ahead. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty as to whether or not if there's any funding available for food service. But so the answer is yes. Could be looking at another substantial loss next year. If the situation were to continue, I think we need to. Um, decide at that point, you know, how we would handle it. Yeah, we couldn't sustain another long term. Okay. All right. So just, just on the back of the radar, just for everyone and for you, that that's something I'd like to hear more about through the summer or as we look at what's happening. Absolutely. Any other questions? Seeing none, I'm going to put the approval of the participation in the Healthy Food Certification Program on the table. Recommend a motion of the Board of Education approve participation in the Healthy Food Certification Program for the school year 2020-2021 as follows. And seeing no objection, I'm just going to waive the reading of the rest of that. Um, Mr. Asa, seconded by Mrs. Leeper. Any last minute questions before we take it to a vote? Seeing none. For a vote, all in favor? I think Ms. Leeper. Do you have a question? No, she was voting. Oh. All in favor? Opposed? Abstentions? Motion passes 9 0. Moving on to the financial report and approval of budget transfers for the 2019 2020 school year. Ms. Michelle? Or is yours, Jill? Okay, as you can see, the, um, the latest projection has us up to about $36 million um, for, uh, for the balance in the 30th. Uh, this is done as of the 23rd. Um, for, you know, some things are um, absolutely final in this, and, and, and others will continue to, um, to change a little bit. Um, through June 30th and even um, in July as we get invoices. Um, I do have to make a correction. Uh, if you'll notice on, on uh, uh, column three, the, the transfer requested, uh, we missed covering the pupil service uh, negative balance in 92,534. So I have to, um, we, we have to cover that and we'll take it out of the personnel service. So that negative 309740 becomes a negative 402274 to cover those other two areas. Um, we, um, as I explained in my memo, this time is a little different. Um, the um, transfers will be done, and then we will, uh, because of the non-lapsing account, we will. Ha we just discovered that we have to transfer all the residual balances and in individual accounts into a transfer out account uh, to be transferred into the um, non-lapsing account. And uh, because right now we're over the 3.3, we would transfer the 3.3 in July when we close, and then we will um, address asking the Board of Finance for the any additional balance in, in the fall when, um, because it's required to vote, uh, and hopefully we'll be able to put that in there also. Any questions for Ms. Lanzell? Mr. Peterson? I'm always the one who asks about the utility. Maybe a joint question for Ms. Lanzell and Mr. Papa George. Just, just to make sure, because when budget time rolls around, these utility numbers are always very fuzzy. Are, are, we, are we certain about these numbers? These numbers are actual build amounts? These are, you, you understand what I'm saying? On the savings? The, the savings you're talking about, the savings, those, those are final. Uh, uh, Mr. Papa George might be able to uh, need to address an issue with heat. A question came up about heat in a, in a few areas, and we were double checking with um, uh, some of the vendors to make sure that they were accurate, but 
Um, I don't know, Angelus, do you remember that situation? Yeah, we're double checking with the vendors to confirm they're accurate and that they were actual meter readings and not estimates. Uh, some of the schools, we also recognize like Roger Ledlow Middle School, the heating bill was higher than we anticipated, but they also ran a food service program there. So there were some schools that were actually still occupied. And even though we initially had shut down the heat in a lot of buildings, we did turn it back on in a few because of some activities going on within the buildings. Sure. I mean, I guess the, you know, the, the foundation of my question is I don't want to be blindsided in July when we get a larger bill than what we anticipated, but it sounds like that's not, if, if we're dealing with actual meter readings, that's not what's going to be happening. Um, and just as a no. tangential question, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. These are the full, these are, these are, this is the full 12 months of the year. We, um, we only pay through May. June is the first month in the, in the next um, fiscal year. So um, if anything, these, these balances might grow if we find that there was a, a mistake um, because we were questioning whether the, why they were, the heat in certain areas were higher than what we anticipated. Okay. Well, I, I did not know that. Thank you. Um, as a tangential question, uh, we came over this in budget season, uh, Angelus, about uh, having better tracking for utilities. There was going to be a software system. Uh, is, part of, is, is any part of that active now? Correct. Um, so we are meeting with a company that does do a better uh, calculations for predicting costs based on past experiences and years. They have a very good reputation of projecting costs for buildings. Uh, we, we were supposed to meet with them in March and that got delayed, but we are now looking at the first or second week in July to meet with them and go over what they could offer to us. All right, that's great. Sorry to go off on a, on a tangent there. I'm all set. Mr. Asam? Yeah, Doreen, sorry, what was the um, first thing you said that was missed that makes that first 309, 740, really 402? What, I, I missed that piece. What, what was missed and where should it be? Uh, in column three, um, you see the negative 309, 740 going down to the um, six charges, but you'll notice nothing was put in um, to the personnel on line 19. There's a negative 92, 534 that needs to be covered there. In column two. Okay, so, so what you're saying is column C, line 19, should be 402 something. No, we need to, to we need to move into there ninety two five thirty four to uh, zero that out. The four zero two okay. two seventy four will be a line line negative four zero two two seventy four. Okay, so that was just simply a, a, a cell calculation error. There's everything listed here. It's just a math error. It's, it's just an oversight and missing that. One number. <laughs> Thank you for clarifying that. Mm -hmm. This is Max Canelli. To piggyback on Mr. Ace's question, um, again, I was the one who, you know, the non lapsing, it always bothered me how we were going to reconcile that. I don't understand the 92,000 because obviously then that means lines one through eight are all inaccurate as well. If we're saying that that is to add up to a number that's 92,534 more, unless I am misunderstanding you. And if that's the case, I don't understand why all those numbers were wrong in the first place. Okay, co columns one and two are absolutely correct. Uh, there's nothing wrong with those numbers. Um, columns. <laughs> then, but if we're transferring money out of an area, that means you didn't spend it. That's what I'm not getting. Okay, we have 1.423 million in personnel services available to move. In column three, we were only moving out. It only shows that we're moving 309, 740 out of there. In essence, we really need to move 402, 274 because 92, 534 of it needs to go uh, on line 19 in column three. Right, that I understand. 
what are you taking that 92,000 from? From the 1,423,000, uh, it's in column two on line nine. Okay, I get that, but that was allocated to something. That's what I'm not getting from this. I under I understand that we're just going to add 92,000 to the 309 number, but if we're saying that we didn't spend it under total personnel services, I'm just asking where did we not spend it? In the line eight in column one, those not, that number is, is good. It's not a matter of where it's coming from. It's a matter of how it got there. It's a matter of where it's going, if that makes any sense. No, but I'm going to my ignorance of accounting, and I'll follow up with you myself because I'd like to understand that. And then okay. my second question is that I assume that if, the Board of Finance does not approve our increase in the amount in the non-lapsing account, that it then becomes a dollar amount being returned to the town. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for Ms. Monzel? Okay. Seeing none. Um, so I need um, the recommended motion. The Board of Education approves the line item transfers for the 2019-2021 fiscal year as detailed in the financial statement per enclosure number three and as amended. As amended. Well, let's make a motion to amend. Well, we didn't put this motion on the table yet. Um, we're in, as Amended by Ms. Monsell. That works. I'm sorry. That, that works. Do you have a motion? Mrs. Gerber, second. Mr. Asa, all in favor? Motion passes 9-0. And Ms. Monsell, can I just um, ask you just to um, email Mrs. Gerber those figures to the minutes? Absolutely. Absolutely. We'll do a, re a revised um, sheet, too. Thank you. To hear, act, and consider, hear, consider, and act upon a letter to the Connecticut State Department of Education, that the Board of Education approves a letter to send to the Connecticut State Department of Education per enclosure number four. Motion. Mr. Asa, seconded by Ms. Leeper. Um, just for the public sake, at our last meeting, Ms. Leeper um, asked the superintendent if there is anything the board could be doing in terms of advocacy at the state level during our meeting. During open board comment, Ms. Max McCallie indicated that she would like to pursue that as well and was willing to work with Ms. Leeper to draft a letter. I had asked the board for to send me any copy or additional feedback that they might have to include in this letter. Um, I didn't receive any revised copy, but I did see an intent, um, the intent of the board was open to hearing what Mrs. Mac McNally and Ms. Leeper would present. Um, and here we are. Ms. Leeper, Mrs. Mac McNally, I will give it to you to just present the letter and give us additional background. Oh. Hold on. You're muted. Yeah. Am I back? Okay. You're back on. We'll start with you, being that you were the first person to um, bring this idea to the board, and follow up with Mrs. Jackson Canelli can speak after you. Sure. So I was just thinking that we have uh, been presented with a unique opportunity to provide some feedback to the state commissioner of the Department of Ed as well as the state. Board of Ed on our experience in a larger sized district in trying to implement their summer school guidelines. Um, and it's our hope that this can help inform their reopening guidelines in the fall. So of course we're not public health experts and we're not in the optimal place to write our own guidance as to what is safest for our students and staff, but what we can do 
is let um, the people who are making those decisions know what is implementable and what has not been implementable um, for a district our size, and then also which guidelines have um, will cause us to need additional funding in order to implement. And you know, I just want to make it public that Connecticut has been a leader in the country in our approach and effectiveness to COVID, and so we're hopeful that this can continue on this trajectory and allow for the reopening of schools. Um, as working parents know, without reopening schools, there can't really be a full reopening of the economy. And so if there's a way that we can help inform the decisions that are being made up in Hartford, um, sort of viewed it as a, a responsibility to do so. And in that wordy preamble, uh, <laughs> we wrote this letter. <laughs> Mrs. Massacanelli? Well, thank you. Um, so. Uh, first, thank you. I hats off to Mrs. Leeper who took the lead on writing the base of the letter. Um, and so it was exactly structured how I'd been envisioning it as well, which is really going right back to the guidelines that were given to the summer school um, and really having a, you know, fact based reflection on what the impact of these guidelines were. Um, I added a few things, but this uh, really is coming from so again, my thanks to her appreciation and my thanks to Mr. Asa for also for taking a look over the letter. Um, but it just, I, I think it's a shame when we, as a body of nine, are in a position to give this feedback. Obviously, we know that some of um, some uh, directive from the state is imminent, and I recognize that. However, it's also my understanding that what we're about to hear is not definite in nature. It's not final in nature, and. This is our opportunity as a board uh, to speak on behalf of our staff, on behalf of other town bodies who recognize the fiduciary impact of these mandates from the state. And so this was our opportunity to, or we wanted to take this opportunity to give that feedback and, and reflect some of our concerns. And I'm always one to believe I'd rather speak up ahead of time. I don't like feeling powerless. I, you know, I wanted to take uh, I wanted to support Mrs. Leeper in the idea of if people are making decisions in a vacuum, and of course I know they've been besieged by you know some feedback, but I don't want to abdicate our responsibility and leave it on to others. Um, and I just thought that this could be an important statement um, of whatever value that this board could um, put forward to the state. Thank you. Um, excuse me, before I just go to Mr. Asa, did I put this motion on the table officially? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Ms. Jason. Yeah, I just, first of all, if I could just ask everybody that's not talking to go on mute, it would be greatly appreciated. Give you a couple seconds to do that. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to thank Ms. Uh, Leeper and Mrs. Maxson Canelli. Um, as Mrs. Maxson Canelli mentioned, um, I, I was supportive of this uh, idea. Um, I didn't necessarily take part in, in the writing of it, but I was able to, you know, to see it. And once I did see it, I do support it. Um, I think we have a uh, opportunity to give the state feedback. And as Mr. Cummings said, we're going to be getting some guidance hopefully later this week. Um, but that guidance is that that's it. It's guidance based on where we hope to be with numbers in the state. Um, Connecticut's doing a phenomenal job right now with um, the lowest rates of transmissions and hospitalizations. Um, so we're going in the right direction, but as everybody knows, that could change on a dime. Um, we're seeing it in other parts of the country, um, but maybe they didn't take as good precautions as Connecticut, but it's still a possibility. And I think we have a, a, an opportunity to inform and give feedback to the state um, officials that are really the ones guiding us. Um, so I do wholeheartedly support the, the notion of this and, and how it's written. Um, I do hope that the um, board supports it. Um, if we do not have unanimous support, I would still myself as an individual board member sign this letter. So thank you. Thank you. Ms. Pippa, did you stand up? I did. I wanted um, just to add that I know as far as giving guidance to the state, I know, Mrs. Vitale, you've been on phone calls through CAVE and uh, through the commissioner. I know Mr. Cummings has. So I just, I've listened to 
what um, the board member said about why they wanted to send the letter, but I just wanted to reiterate, this wasn't the only way that we were giving feedback. Thank you, Ms. Pico. Yes, and as we shared at the last meeting, Mr. Cummings, you know, through CAPS, um, I participate every week. CABE does have a board check-in for board chairs. Um, the head of CABE is in weekly meetings with the commissioner. He actually joked, the commissioner joked that he sees Bob Rader more than he does his own children. So board chairs throughout the state have shared feedback. I will fully appreciate that this is a different um, avenue for communication and I absolutely support the board wanting to to have a united voice in this. Um, but I do want for the public to know that feedback has been given to state officials. It may not be direct. It has been through um, the association's members. But that said, we have had this commissioner was on the board chair call last week. Um, he did indicate that the summer guidelines were drafted at the end of April at a time that COVID was peaking. Um, so the guidance was given based on the fact that they had at that time. The last two months, thankfully, the numbers are better in Connecticut. They've learned, health officials have learned a lot about this virus. There's still a lot they don't know. But he hinted that maybe the guidance that we're going to be seeing this week will be less restrictive than what was put forth in the summer. But, um, you know, that remains to be seen. But thank you, Ms. Uh, Ms. Jacobson? Um, hi, Jen Jacobson. Um, thank you to Mrs. Leeper, Mrs. Knox, and Kennelly, and everyone involved um, in this letter. I'm personally thrilled to see us acting as a body to send some uh, advocacy out of Fairfield <laughs> together. Um, I had submitted actually to the chair and Mr. Cummings and, and the leadership um, a request if it was possible if we had any actual or estimated numbers for some of the items that are in this letter. And I know that Mr. Cummings, you said that you were going to see if they were readily available, not wanting staff to spend a lot of time on digging this up, but even if we had any estimates of, you know, the number of custodians or the cost of all the supplies, just the extra nurses. I mean, were we able to get any of that that we could add to this letter or we not, not have any of that? We have, uh, uh, I have, I have one piece of information based on what we know about about transportation expectations. Um, and Ms. Mansell was able to put this together and I'll just read you the number. Um, if we were to follow the, uh, the transportation expectations into the, for the summer program into the new school year, um, we would need an additional 177 buses for a cost of about $20 million. That's exactly what I'm talking about. So I think that that kind of information if we have, if we, I don't know if anyone, uh, Jen and Jen are amenable to adding that to this letter um, as an, I don't know if this is an amendable document at this point or just open to feedback at this point. Um, and if there's just anything else like that, I know this is a very timely situation that we need to get this out probably pretty quickly, but I just think even just that one point or anything else that we can add that actually lends the meat to what we know to be true. Um, Second of all, and I don't know if Mrs. Mexington-Kennelly or Mrs. Leeper would be amenable to this too, I was wondering if you would be amenable to see seeing the interim commissioner of public health or the governor on this letter. Since ultimately it will be his guidelines that come out for the fall. Ms. Leeper? Yeah. Ms. McKinley? Just quickly to say, I was viewing this as like an editable, editable document. So whatever board uh, members had changes that you'd like reflected in here, I think that's great. This, I was treating this sort of as just like a, a draft for us to work off of. And I completely agree that having the numbers makes this much more powerful in the scale of which some of these guidelines are not implementable clear for um, both the public and also um, administration. So I would be happy to put those things and of course also add both the governor and I think you said the interim um, director of the Department of Public Health. Did I miss anything? 
Thank you. And I agree. Right now, this is in the governor's hands, so if we're going to send this letter, we should absolutely copy him on this. Mrs. Max Canelli? Um, so as a matter of process, is it, uh, cause there, is it a process? So then we need to make a, a motion to amend this that after the Fairfield Board of Education, CC, Governor Ned Lamont, and I don't know the person's name, so I don't know what to have in there, if people are okay with that being fudgy and we figure it out to add, but now I'm also realizing, should we also have all nine names? Ms. Weeper? My preference is to have all nine names, but I was hesitant to put anybody's name even on the draft letter before we talked about it. So I had sort of put the Fairfield Board of Ed kind of as a stand-in just preliminarily before we had this conversation. That's all. So I, I would want to put forward the motion to make three additions to this letter. One, almost a verbatim quote of Mr. Cummings of just that fact sentence after the, oh, last place, um, after the single sentence of the second paragraph, you know, for 2020-2021, these guidelines would, in, would have entailed or would entail 177 buses at the cost of $20 million. That would be the first part. The second part would be the addition of our names, and the third part would be the CC. And Mrs. Gerber, I am sorry for the worst worded amendment ever. Okay, so that is your amendment. Can I have a second to the amendment? Wait, can I ask a clarifying question? Yeah. In, um, Mrs. Madison Canelli, in your amendment, did you include the addition of the governor and the Okay, sorry, I didn't hear that. Just wanted to make sure. Mr. Asian. Okay. Um, so, Mr. Asian, um, So, discussion of the. Oh, my goodness. So, to be clear, Mrs. Maxson Canelli made the motion and I seconded it. Yeah, thank you. All right, discussion on the amendment. Ms. Pickle, you had your hand up. Agreed with Mrs. Jacobson, and I don't think that that should be the only dollar amount that we should put in there. I think that we should talk about how much additional staffing we needed in order to have um, live instruction, um, extra costs, extra services. All, all of that dollar amount needs to be in there in that letter to show what it would cost the district in order to provide that education. Mrs. Gerber? Well, I, I, I think, and I don't want to put words in Mr. Cummings' mouth, but I, I do think that the, when this information was requested, um, it, you know, when Mrs. Jacobson asked for that information, he said he would do what he could that wouldn't take up too much staff time, and the only information we had was the bus information, which I think is very compelling. Um, and I do think, as other board members have mentioned, that the clock is ticking, and if we've been told that, you know, the preliminary guidelines at least are going to be coming out this week that you know it's going to be july soon that i would just hesitate to spend too much time trying to track down other numbers because it could use up a tremendous amount of staff time um and i just think that we should not wait too long to get this moving so uh, can i just say um that that was in, in the guidance that we got from the state around summer school. The transportation was a hard wall. I mean, it was clear what that entailed. The other numbers around custodial services, cleaning, those would be uh, more difficult to um, determine once until we have students actually back in school and we have a better understanding of what the state is going to require under that. So that, that was the best number we could give, given the amount of time we had with everything else going on. I'm also hesitant to have staff, staff that spend too much time on this, considering this is for the summer guidelines, which is passed. We don't necessarily know what the fall guidelines will look like based on some early conversations from um, the commissioner, who fully knows he's hearing it from pretty much everybody that the transportation guidance is cost prohibitive. So I'm very interested to see what that looks like, if we put a hard number to that, and just keep on drilling that back. Um, I, home to the state. I think that is compelling. Um, I agree with Mrs. Gerber. We really um, should act upon this 
think the fact that we're sending it is um, yeah. valuable, but we shouldn't wait. Mrs. Weeper? Oh, no, I don't have anything to add other than I agree. I think, um, you know, that one data point alone highlights highlights what we're up against with these guidelines. Okay, Ms. Jacobson, sorry. Um, I just wanted to, as we're voting on the amendment, give you the actual name of the acting commissioner um, of Department of Public Health if you want that for the record, for the letter or not. Do right, you want me to give you the name? Yep. Yes. Okay, Deirdre, D-E-I-D-R-E, -E, Gifford, G-I-F-F-O-R-D, and she is serving as the acting commissioner of DPH, or Department of Public Health. Thank you. Any other comments on the amendment? Okay, take it to the floor for vote on the amendment. Do you need it reread or everybody good? Okay, um, all in favor of the motion as amended? Ms. Jacobs, need your hand up. Motion carries 9-0. Back to the main motion. Any additional comments on the main motion? As amended? Ms. Rotelli? Hey. Just want... oh, we're losing your body. Oh, can you hear me? Can hear you now. Okay. I just wanted to thank um, Jennifer Lieber and Jen Maxim Pinelli for writing this. I think it's a great idea. And I'm glad that we can all act as a board together to get some feedback to the state. Thank you. Okay, any other comments? Okay, seeing none, to the board for a vote. Uh, all in favor, motion carries 9-0. Thank you, Ms. Leeper and Mrs. Max Canelli. Okay, moving on, that the Board of Education approve employment contract with the Superintendent of Schools, Michael Cummings, from July 1st, 2020 to June 30th, 2023. Mrs. Gerber, seconded by Ms. Jacobson. Um, I'm also going to, we usually do not discuss uh, personnel issues in front uh, in public. So um, I just want to uh, just say thank you, Mr. Cummings, that we are happy to put, move this motion forward, me personally. Um, all in favor? What? No. I believe we need to make uh, yeah. some. Um, Amendment. Motions here on this motion, <laughs> amendment motions. Um, Mrs. Can I have a motion? Well, Mrs. Gerber, would you like to make a motion to amend? Yes, I would like to make a motion to amend. Thank you. Um, I would like to add to the motion um, uh, the following uh, wording, following uh, the June 30th, 2023, and then add, and that the Fairfield Board of Education set the superintendent's base salary for 2020-21 at a 2% increase over the 2019-20 base salary. Can I have a second to that? Mr. Asa, um, any discussion? Seeing none, back to the board. We're voting on the amendment to the main motion. All in favor? Ms. Telly, Ms. Jacobson, Ms. Pico, Ms. Leeper. Mr. Peterson, Mr. Asa, Mr. Scrubber, Mrs. Maxicelli, Mrs. Vitale, motion carries 9-0. Ms. Vitale, did I say you? Um, motion carries 9-0. Back to the main motion, as amended. To the board, all in favor? Motion carries 9-0. Thank you. Um, Mr. Cummings, I speak to the full board that we we're looking forward to working with you in the upcoming year. We have a lot of, uh, of important work to do, and I hope, I think that I speak for everyone, 
that I hope that we get to do that work in person, in school buildings, and together. Well, I love seeing you all um, on my screen. Um, I miss seeing you in person. Thank you for, for your work in which I think we're going to call it crisis year. It's been one crisis after the other. Um, and I think it speaks to the community that we appreciate your, your thoughtful, ethical leadership. Um, and thank you. Thank you for your, for, your, for your service to our children, for our staff, and, and really to our entire community. It's been a very difficult time. Um, and our school district, and this is to not only to you as the school district leader, but to the staff that are all here, um, that I'm looking at all of you. I wanted to say thank you. Um, you know, it, it really, there's so many people that got us through these last three months. Um, and I appreciate all the hard work. I, it's been a long, a long haul. Um, we're not done yet, but um, if I, I couldn't have asked for better people to, um, to lead us through this. So thank you, and to any teachers um, listening, actually I hope nobody, no teachers are listening, I hope everybody is enjoying time with their family. We thank them as well. So with that, we're gonna move on. I know that everybody is getting tired. Approval of the June 9th, 2020 special and regular meeting minutes. The Board of Education approved the BOE special and regular meeting minutes dated June 9th, 2020. All in favor mm. or a motion, Mrs. Gerber. Well, you know what, it would help me if you all didn't raise your hand at the same time. Mrs. Gerber, seconded by Mr. Peterson. Any discussion? Seeing none, to the board for a vote. Everybody's raising their hand. All, motion carries 9-0. Superintendent's report. All right, all right, well, I'm off, all right, thank you. Thank you again, uh, and I just want to echo just tell you what you just said. Um, you know, I'm, uh, I'm very fortunate. I think we're all very fortunate that we work with a talented group of uh, staff in the Fairfield Public Schools, and that I, I want that statement to be uh, heard as inclusively as possible because it really extends out to everybody who works here and the jobs they do. I think that there's a great abiding concern for for students that not only permeates the school district, but clearly the town as well. And um, with that as a, a force, really, um, our staff responded this year. And um, I want to echo, too, the, the thanks to the executive directors who are with us tonight. Um, you know, c clearly, clearly this job can't be done. My job can't be done without them. Uh, in the best of times, it certainly can't be done in the most difficult of times. And I, I want to call out especially um, Ms. Gottesman, who has had no idea what she was signing up for uh, back in August when she agreed to come on and do the interim deputy superintendent job. No idea what this year would evolve into, and I, I want to thank her for her friendship and support. And also, uh, Mr. Arnone, um, who um, picked a heck of a year to go out on retirement, but perhaps perhaps it helped contribute to the decision. Um, and I, again, uh, we're gonna miss their their presence, their leadership in the Fairfield Public Schools. So I just wanna extend my thanks to them. And I look forward to welcoming Dr. Parrish and Dr. Zavichancic, um, who will be with us starting uh, next week, next week for both of them. Um, and they're, they're taking, um, taking their seats at the table to help us move forward. Um, I also, um, in the thank you mood, I want to thank, um, again, everybody who put together support for the high school graduations last week. Uh, for anybody who attended, for anybody who, who heard about them, um, they were clearly quite successful. We could not have done this, I'm going to say this uh, forever, we could not have done this without the support of the first black woman, um, the chief of the fire and police, Department of Public Works, Parks and Recreation, and all the folks that helped out on that night. But also a special thanks to the headmasters for their leadership around this. Um, Mr. Commander has extended themselves and got into territory, um, which I'm sure never, I, I can testify, is not part of the administrator training program. Um, their, their work was just exemplary. And, and those, those two ceremonies um, were very special. I think, I think the town needed them, the graduates certainly needed them, but they were just very special nights. Um, 
So my thanks to them. Real quick on, uh, on the reentry update, as has been mentioned throughout the evening, we are expecting Thursday morning to get a guidance on the returns of school in the fall. Um, as we've said before, this is guidance, not rules. Um, and based on local numbers and regional numbers, there's going to be some differentiation across the state. Um, so I would suspect that um, uh, you know we're going to see some variance between, say, Fairfield County and Wyndham County for those types of things. But we should be getting that Thursday morning. I do have. I just saw tonight that I have a uh, superintendent have a phone call with the commissioner at 10 a.m. Thursday morning. So once we have that guidance and once we actually have a document, I'm hoping for a draft document will be shared with us as well. We're going to send that out to the community. We have uh, surveys ready to go for both uh, parents and staff. Um, and then once we have that guidance, we'll, we'll send that, a link out to that guidance as well as links to the surveys. And I'm going to ask folks before they respond to the surveys to just read through the guidance so um, they have an understanding of really what the guidance is going to require. It's going to be far more beneficial for everybody's input and for our planning to be reacting to um, tangible plans and expectations rather than assumptions. Um, we're right now working against assumptions, and, and that's a dangerous uh, place to be. So we'll have we'll have more clarity on Thursday morning, and, and again those those surveys will go out to everybody um, that afternoon, or that morning, or that afternoon. Um, we are working. The, the committee has met, and subcommittees are meeting. Um, now to begin working on the different parts of our reentry plan. Again, this work will accelerate now that we have know what we're getting getting into or have a better understanding of what we're going to be expected of us. So we'll be doing that. Um, uh, that work is continuing, and as, as that move, work moves forward, we will again be providing that information to uh, everybody in town and in the school community. Um, and I think that is it. Um, I just again want to wish everybody a happy and safe summer. Okay. Moving on, committee and lean town reports. Ms. Mascanelli? Yeah, first, actually, I had a question on the superintendent's report, if I can back up. Uh, yeah, sorry, any question on the superintendent's report? Ms. Mascanelli, floor is yours. Um, just one quick question, especially since I noticed we do still have callers on the meeting. Um, and I, I don't know if this is to Mr. Cummings or to you, Ms. Vitale, but to the point of the guidelines and the surveys and the information, um, I don't know if you could speak to the board's intention of having a July meeting, if this would be as since that's something that the public might want to be clued into and, and to the point of now working off of more concrete guidelines. We will be having a July meeting. The date has not been set yet. Um, in part, we um, have some other business to attend to. So I want you with the Board of Finance to want to try to schedule uh, multiple things on a multiple night. So once I schedule um, check with the chair of the Board of Finance. We have um, some discussions around collective bargaining that we need to meet with them about. Um, we will set a date. But for the public's knowledge, um, stay tuned. There's a lot of work. So you're saying have a good summer. Um, I was going to interrupt saying you, we are not done. <laughs> um, <laughs> it would be nice, <laughs> but um, Maybe a couple of weeks, we can take a little bit of a breather, but um, there's a lot of work to be done. As once these guidelines are out, um, you know, we hope it's going to be full steam ahead. Um, the board will be meeting in July. We'll have a meeting, you know, as scheduled in August. We'll have to see how it goes. We may need to have another one at the beginning of August as well. Um, so, yeah, put it on. You'll be hearing from me about a date. Any other questions for Mr. Cummings? Ms. Jacobson. Um, yes, Jen Jacobson. Um, Mr. Cummings, I know that we're, the guidelines are imminent on Thursday, likely. Um, I was just wondering, just because the public might be interested to know, is your reopening committee continuing to meet um, since these guidelines are relatively late, so to speak? Um, incoming or is that kind of on pause right now or just what the process is in terms of once you have them what's happening um the subcommittees of the committee will be working so there's there's about 20 members of the committee at this point of the reentry committee but we we know we're going to need to expand some of that work with some of the tasks that are uh, around us for example 
of the program directors are not on as part of the committee, but they are uh, at working as a subcommittee around instruction and curriculum work, which will take place through, during the month of July. Um, there's a mitigation committee, essentially the kind of group that has to work around social social distancing um, and the procedures for students re-entering school, what that's going to look like every day, you know, any expectations are, that may come around temperature taking or masks or those types of things. And Mr. Papa George and uh, Ms. Mitchell from the health department are leading that group. So um, there will be different groups working on these things. And quite honestly, I think we're going to kind of try to divide and conquer um, the number of tasks that are in front of us um, before we bring the full committee back together again, because there's just so much that has to get done. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for the superintendent? Seeing none, committee liaison reports. Does anybody have any reports? Mrs. Gerber? Uh, yeah, um, just on Mill Hill, um, we just got an email from the uh, chair of the committee, Mr. Quinn, that um, there will not be a meeting um, tomorrow, um, but there will be, the next meeting will take place on Wednesday, July 8th, and that will be when they're going to go through the bids and come up with a, uh, an updated construction schedule. So I am planning, and they are going to, as of now, uh, hopefully do it in person um, at Mill Hill uh, with the committee. I don't know if I will be allowed to go. I'm not quite sure how the numbers are going to be working with that. So um, I'm assuming there'll be a way. And, and, and Mr. Quinn did say anyone who is not comfortable with participating in person that they would be able to call in. So um, I, I'm sure that's still a work in progress. Um, we've got two weeks, so um, I'll let everyone know what happens. But either. If I can attend in person, I will try to. If not, then I will do it remotely or however they're allowing people to do it who can't be there in person, and I will uh, report back. Hopefully when we meet in July, I'll be able to give some more information about that. Ms. Um, so I'm sure many of you have heard that there is anticipated to be a special session of the General Assembly. So you, uh, you may be hearing from me as well in the summer. Um, if there is, once I have an actual piece of legislation or pieces of legislation that may impact us or affect us, um, I will be sure to send that to you. And um, of course, let me know if you have any thoughts or questions on that. Thank you. Mr. Peterson. I haven't had a hot hill up for a while, but uh, I just want to let you know that uh, you know, the gym floor is being replaced this summer. I have uh, photographic evidence that the gym floor is in. It does look beautiful. Uh, it needs to be finished and uh, has lines put down, but other than that, everything there is on schedule. Thank you. Anybody else? Mrs. Mascanelli. Yes, um, just two things from policy committee. First, I just wanted to put the board on alert. Uh, that you will be seeing at that July meeting um, a policy regarding student insurance for their Chromebooks. And um, I know you always read our policies carefully, but it would be especially good to look at that one um, with a special attention to detail for July because we are planning to roll this out or we are hoping, it's the uh, administration's hope and the policy committee's hope that this is ready to go for the start of the school year. So that while nothing, of course, is binding till we vote at it in the second meeting, um, if there are issues, it would be very helpful to get those on the table at this first meeting in July um, for that first read. So that's one thing. The second thing I just wanted to report out um, from today's policy committee is that, as you all recall, in this spring, uh, we voted on changes to policy 3100 for our budget. Um, some of the changes were just organic to the process, but one especially was due to our three-year conversation regarding athletics. And so that one of the changes that we made or the intention that we signal, uh, which is then um, brought to or notified to the public in the administrative regs, involves a presentation to the board um, at the start of the school year. And so Mr. Cummings had asked policy to put together some ideas on what that presentation should look like. And obviously it, there's, you know, this is going to be round one. It will get better from here going forward. Um, but because that conversation had its genesis with us, uh, Mr. Cummings came to us. But at this point, I would 
um, ask that it be handed over to finance to Mrs. Leeper if it could be added to your agenda that you can and I will um, CC you on the work that we did in policy today so that because really at this point it is a finance matter um, policy had wanted the presentation to take place but in terms of the nuances or the um, details of that report uh, we certainly know that what it looks like at this first iteration it will change from there for a variety of reasons that I'll talk about at the start of the school year um, but just wanted to say it was I'm, I'm looking forward to that I think it's something that will be of benefit uh, to everybody in the community the sleeper is giving the thumbs up to the public thank you um, to the policy committee for your work on this and um, we will send it to the Finance Committee to review and prepare for a presentation to the board in the fall. Any other reports? Seeing none, moving on to open board comment. Anybody have any, Ms. Fertelli? Hi, can you hear me? Can you hear you? <laughs> okay, great. Um, I know we're not done. I'm ready to meet in July, but as we're wrapping up the school year, um, this has been a very interesting year to join the board <laughs> and I just um, I'm all about gratitude and I wanted to take some time to thank all of you guys because I have reached out to most of you um, and everybody has been very welcoming and helpful and I really appreciate it and I'm just thankful to be working with you all as a group so thank you Happy to have you, Bonnie. Anybody else? Mrs. Gerber? Um, yeah, I, I know uh, Mr. Cummings had mentioned the graduation, but I just wanted to circle back on that since we had discussed graduation at a few of our meetings. And um, I just wanted to say that uh, this is, I guess, probably the ninth um, graduation ceremony that I've been to as a board member and certainly the most memorable and as a parent of a senior um, I just cannot thank everyone who is responsible for pulling off what is really a truly incredible uh, accomplishment um, for both schools um, I wasn't at Ward but I saw pictures and I heard about it and uh, I know Ludlow is just wonderful and I have yet to talk to any Ludlow parent or student or ward parent or student who didn't just have just amazing things to say about it so it was a really great way to end a very very peculiar school year and uh, so thank you for that Ms. Jacobson just what she said I mean I'll just reiterate that I don't want to belabor the point but it's just every all the feedback I've heard has just been even people who were skeptical that it was going to come off without a hitch and it was just uh, the feedback's just been wonderful and so grateful for um, so much work and the volunteers that went into it so just just echoing Mrs. Gerber's point so just thank you again anybody else I just want to um I agree about graduation thank you everyone involved it was um it was unforgettable. They're going to be talking about that graduation for decades to come in Fairfield. And um, with your miss, I just want to, Ms. Goddison, thank you for your service this past year. It's been a pleasure working with you. We're going to miss you. You have to come back and visit us when we can, can see you live. Mr. Arnone, you as well. We're, we're going to miss you as well. So come back and visit when you can. Okay. Um, Public comment, again, to the public, um, there is a form on the Board of Education website. If you would like to leave public comment about any of the agenda items for this meeting, please fill out the form. You can also email public comment at fairfieldschools.org. We look forward to hearing from you. And with that, can I have a motion to adjourn? Mr. Peterson, seconded by Ms. Leeper, all in favor? Motion carries 9-0.